times when you were younger did you think it would be exciting to sleep in a haunted hotel? Well, tonight you're going to find out on Paranormal Truth. I'm Linnea Quigley. Hello, my name is Patrick Allen, and this is Linnea Quigley's Paranormal Truth, a series of films where we delve into the paranormal world of the unknown. In this episode, we're going to investigate the scary world of the Cecil Hotel. Murder and suicide have consistently plagued this downtown Los Angeles establishment. It has been home to Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, LA's most brutal, unsolved murder, and Richard Ramirez, the infamous Night Stalker serial killer who gripped the hearts of Californians with fear in the 1980s. The Cecil is like a magnet, uh, attracting all sorts of notorious murders and disappearances and, and crimes. You feel safe, but it's actually not that safe. The, since the moment you get there, you're going to feel that, that bad energy, you know, when you get to the Cecil Hotel. I do think that some places are just bad, and, uh, and I do believe that the Cecil Hotel is bad. Now in 1962, there was a woman named Julia Moore and she was on the eighth floor of the hotel and she jumped out the window. Helen Gurney in 54, she jumped from the seventh floor window of her room landing on the uh, marquee in the front of the hotel. And then there was another one named Pauline Otten in 62, she was on the ninth floor. She jumped out the window and landed on a 65 year old man walking by. Richard Ramirez was born in Texas and he was born bad, I think. He would break into people's houses. He was high, obviously, on drugs before he'd go in. And, you know, he'd have that rush and he'd have his knife and his gun. Usually he'd rape the women. He would torture them. The men usually die first. He would um, shoot them. Sometimes we'd tell him to swear upon Satan. Ramirez did stay at the Cecil Hotel during the period of time where most of the murders occurred. It was his little home base while he was, uh, while he was committing most of the crimes. The great epoch of our life is when we gain the courage to rebaptize our e evil qualities as being our best qualities. Jack Unterweger came to Los Angeles. He was a crime journalist from Vienna, and he chose the Cecil Hotel specifically because of Richard Ramirez. And while he was there, he actually murdered three prostitutes. He strangled them with their own brassiers. The entire seedy underbelly of the city was located in that area immediately around the Cecil, and so I think he, he really felt at home there. If he had a little bit power by himself, he, lay, he tried to uh, set you under pressure. Uh, there was a, a lot of violence inside him, otherwise he wouldn't have killed so many, so many people. It was easier for him to fall back in his old behavior. A grim discovery in the downtown L.A. hotel. Police say the body found in a hotel water tank is that of a 21-year-old Canadian tourist, Elisa Lam. If you could go to the roof and see that, there's no way she could have crawled up there and killed herself. They're trying to say she killed herself. That's why they didn't do nothing to nobody here. Many questions arise. She was a young, trusting woman, alone, traveling. How did she get up to the roof? and somehow jump in? Did she commit suicide? I don't think that's what happened. Most recently, Alyssa Lamb, a guest at the hotel, had a bizarre episode in an elevator, then mysteriously disappeared. Not long after guests began complaining about the taste, smell, and low pressure of their tap water. When hotel maintenance investigated what was believed to be a relatively inaccessible rooftop water tank, they were horrified to discover the decomposing body of young Alyssa floating within. 
So dark is the story of the Cecil Hotel that it even inspired an entire season of the hit television show American Horror Story. The Cecil was built in 1924 by three hoteliers, William Banks Hanner, Charles L. Dix, and Robert H. Shops, as a destination for business travelers and tourists. The hotel cost $1.5 million to complete and boasted an opulent marble lobby with stained glass windows, potted palms, and an alabaster statuary. But within five years of its opening, the United States sank into the Great Depression. Although the hotel flourished as a fashionable destination through the 1940s, the decades beyond saw the hotel decline, as the nearby area known as Skid Row became increasingly populated with transients. As many as 10,000 homeless people lived within a four-mile radius. By the 1950s, the hotel had gained a reputation as a residence for transients. As the area where the hotel is located began to decline, suicides and other violent deaths on the premises became more frequent. The first documented suicide at the Cecil was reported in 1931, when a guest named W.K. Norton died in his room after taking poison capsules. Throughout the 1940s and 50s, more suicides at the Cecil occurred. By the 1960s, longtime residents had begun to call the Cecil the suicide. In so many ways, the Cecil is, is like, you know, a metaphor for the city of Los Angeles and Hollywood. It's all facade, it's all glitz on the outside, and it's got this romantic, turbulent, sinister history. Everyone who comes here with hopes and dreams and stars in their eyes, uh, it's, it's the noir side of the city. In addition to suicides, the Cecil's history includes other kinds of violence and disturbing happenings. It also became a notorious rendezvous spot for adulterous couples, drug activity, and a common ground for sex workers. In 1947, Elizabeth Short, dubbed by the media as the Black Dahlia, was rumored to have been spotted drinking at the Cecil's bar in the days before her notorious and to date, unsolved murder. Los Angeles, home to the stars of Tinseltown, the home also to murder. The horrific slaying of Betty Short, AKA the Black Dahlia, has captured the imagination of the Southland and baffled the best minds in law enforcement. The brutal killing of aspiring actress Elizabeth Short shocked Los Angeles. Young, beautiful victim. All this during a time when serial killers weren't wanting rampant, it captured the public's imagination. And became the most famous unsolved case in Hollywood history. Now, the Black Dahlia murder is being brought to life in a new series, I Am The Night. You remember that murder case? There's no information. You gotta remember where you are. And after 72 years, the family of one of the key suspects is finally speaking out. Dr. George Hodell. He was a brilliant man, a loving parent in many ways, but also, I'm sorry to say, a killer. Yeah, isn't it shocking? And Steve Hodell believes his father was the culprit. He joins us now from Los Angeles. Steve, thank you for your time this morning. You've written five books on this case, and you allege that it's your father who did this. How did you go about investigating your own father on this case? Well, uh, actually, it was uh, my father died in 1999 and uh, certain phys uh, effects came into my possession. And then uh, he was a remarkable man, and of course the first third of my first book goes into the heavy bi biographics. You kind of have to understand the man to understand uh, the crimes. But basically a remarkable individual, and I'm talking to my half-sister on the phone a couple of days after his passing, and, and she sa says to me, well, you know, Steve, our father was a suspect in the Black Dahlia murder. I said, what the hell are you talking about, Tamar? Where is this coming from? And she said, well, he, he didn't do it, but he, he was suspected by the police. They told me that back during the trial. Well, my half-sister and I had ta talked to maybe 20 minutes in 50 years. So this was a huge shock. Of course, I had become very close to my father in the last decade of his life. He had relocated back to the U.S. Mm. And uh, there was no way. I said, this, this, is, this isn't possible. So uh, basically I started uh, looking into it and uh, 
you know, I had been a homicide detective for 24 years with LAPD, and I'd been retired for 15 years, and uh, never any hints or clues or anything. So I was confident that I'd be able to establish that he had nothing to do with it. And I started uh, following the evidence and, and actually relocated back to L.A. And, and within a year and a half, I had built a case, much to my surprise, that took me 180 degrees in the opposite direction and actually became a fileable case. I submitted it in secret to the DA and he said that uh, he would file the case where my father's still alive. So Steve, just tell us about the evidence uh, that you have. What, what did you find? Oh gosh, well it takes took me five books to do it, but basically the, you know, to cut to the chase, um, first, of, first of all, they knew that uh, she, had, she had been found at a vacant lot posed and surgically bisected not cut in half with a saw or, you know, but it was a skilled surgeon. So, of course, that limits your pool right there. Well, my father had been a surgeon in his early years of doctoring, so he certainly had that ability. But then uh, there were a whole bunch of things Then I would discover that he actually knew her and was dating her. Uh, he had been, become a suspect in 1949 and arrested for incest, for having sexual uh, relations with my half-sister Tamar back in 49. Uh, three-week trial he beat the case but basically there were three witnesses present adults and um, so he was a powerful what, what they called in that day a high jingo he was uh, untouchable and the head of LA County Health Department and I started digging in and uh, eventually um, I built an, a case that would you know basically open the door to the secret files which nobody knew anything about we got into those DA files, and lo and behold, he was the prime suspect all along. You know, I mean, Steve Hodell could talk for, you know, 20 hours on why his father did it, but here we've actually got an independent, separate file locked away for 55 yeah. years. And, and Steve, it's, all, it's incredible, because your dad basically confessed to the murder of Elizabeth Short, the Black Dahlia, and his secretary. Why was he not prosecuted? Well... Actually, he, you know, what they did was they tape recorded him 18 detectives 24-7 for 42 days around the clock. And they got him not only to confess to the Black Dahlia murder, and these are not phone taps. These are like microphones hidden in the wall that he had no idea were there. And uh, so he cops to paying police. You know, and you have to understand L.A. was a very corrupt department back then. It was a real-life L.A. confidential, if you will. And... Uh, so a lot of the cops were on the take, and Dad had a lot of money and a lot of power and a lot of influence. And he was performing abortions for the police department and the po politicos of the day. And he was about to be arrested by the DA's office, who had actually taken over the investigation. And we're literally uh, days away from arresting him, and he splits, leaves the country. And uh, he's in the wind. And uh, you kind of have to understand the politics of L.A. at the time. Chief Parker, who's our most famous uh, police chief, was about to take over, literally weeks away from uh, assuming becoming chief. And they thought, well, wait a minute, he's in the wind, he's gone, he's left the country. Maybe uh, it's best if we just lock this away for now and uh, you know, keep it under wraps. We'll come back to it, but let's clean up Dodge, get rid of all the corruption. Uh, if, we, if we expose this now, we won't be able to assume power and do what we want to do. So there was, that was a major factor, and uh, of course, they were happy that he was gone in the sense that, you know, he could reveal a, a hell of a lot about a hell of a lot of people. The sad thing is they never came back to it. They just locked it away. Actually, the LAPD destroyed all the files and the tapes. Wow. But the DA's office, the lieutenant in charge, you know, kept a second set of books, locked him away. And then when my book came out with all the evidence and the DA said he'd file, that, that opened up this vault and it revealed all the tape well, recordings. And, and a lot of that is being revealed in this terrific new show, which is featured here on Stan here, the streaming service, called I Am The Night. There's also the, the terrific podcast too, Root of Evil. Uh, Steve, uh, thank you so much for your time this morning. Also, you can get Steve's latest book, Black Dahlia Avenger 3, uh, and the Black Dahlia series is out there as well, and it's a fascinating read. Thank you so much, Steve. Thank you, Steve. Good, good to be with you. In 1964, a retired telephone operator named Pigeon Goldie Osgood, 
who had been a well-known and well-liked long-term resident at the hotel, was found dead in her room. She had been raped, stabbed, and beaten, and her room ransacked. A man named Jacques B. Ellinger was charged with Osgood's murder, but was later cleared. Her death remains unsolved. Perhaps most infamously, in the 1980s, the hotel was rumored to be the residence of serial killer Richard Ramirez, nicknamed the Night Stalker. Ramirez entered the courtroom wearing sunglasses and shackles. He's accused of 43 crimes, including 13 murders and multiple counts of rape, robbery, sodomy, and oral copulation. Outside the courtroom, metal detectors were used to beef up security. Dozens of spectators crowded the hallway, hoping to get a glimpse of the accused serial killer. Ramirez was captured nearly three and a half years ago by an angry group of citizens in East L.A. He was caught trying to steal someone's car. Police say he had terrorized much of greater Los Angeles by entering homes through unlocked doors or windows. Authorities say he raped, robbed, and killed many of his victims. Most were in the San Gabriel Valley. Following his capture, reports surfaced tying Ramirez to Satanism. He once flashed a pentagram drawn on his hand, and in an earlier court appearance, he shouted, Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Today, nearly three and a half years later, the trial of Richard Ramirez is finally underway. The long delay was the result of changing lawyers, trying to get the trial moved to another city, and allegations of racism by prospective jurors. It took six months just to pick a jury of 12 with 12 alternates. Prosecutor Phil Halpin began a no-nonsense, chronological account of what Ramirez allegedly did. He would not give a public assessment of the case or the evidence, but he did say the long delay may make it difficult for the witnesses who are called to testify. And I suspect there'll be, there'll be problems with memory of, of those people that appear. But nothing unmanageable. Uh, well, at, at that point, it's, it's unfortunately, it, it puts the pressure on the witnesses. Defense lawyer Daniel Hernandez tried to elude reporters. Hernandez, can you talk to us at all? No, he can't. Can you tell me anything about your opening statement? Ramirez had been a regular presence on the Skid Row area of Los Angeles, and according to a hotel clerk who claims to have spoken to him, Ramirez is rumored to have stayed at the Cecil for a few weeks. Ramirez may have engaged in part of his killing spree while staying there. Back up on the sidewalk, close play. Go back. Back up on the sidewalk. Understanding all that. It was the moment the about to be convicted killer did not want to face. You give up your right to be present while the verdicts are read here in open court. Yes. The judge granted the request. And over the intercom to his holding cell, Richard Ramirez heard the verdicts. Guilty of murder. 13 murders. Guilty of rape. 11 sex crimes. Guilty of burglary at the residence of dwelling house. 19 additional felonies. Guilty. Guilty on all counts. And when the prosecutors and investigative team emerged into the court's overcrowded hallway, their relief was apparent. Relieved is a good word. Glad it's over. Legal proceedings against the devil-worshipping drifter began four years ago. Early on, he had displayed a satanic symbol and proclaimed, Hail Satan. Hail Satan. Ramirez became less talkative when trial itself finally began nine months ago. The prosecution presented 138 witnesses, their testimony filling 8,000 pages, but never did the jury hear from Ramirez himself. His attorney said the verdicts elicited no reaction from Ramirez in his cell. He was not surprised uh, at all. Like I said, he, he expected this uh, decision to come down. He felt from weeks behind back that he could not get a fair trial. Jurors cannot yet discuss the case publicly because they still must decide the punishment. But it is clear it has not been easy for them, particularly not after one of the original jurors was murdered last month by her suicidal boyfriend. 
But with an alternate, the jury restarted and took 22 days of deliberation. The lead prosecutor is not ready to relax. I do not lose sight of the fact that we have more to do, and uh, we don't want any glitches between now and the end of this, or else we talk about having to do the whole thing over. To date, it has cost taxpayers more than a million and a half dollars. Next week, the jury will be asked to decide the fate of Ramirez. Defense attorneys do not want to discuss what evidence they'll present at the penalty phase. They don't want to reveal how they'll try to persuade the jury not to send Ramirez to death row. But the defense did say Ramirez himself will not take the stand to argue for his own life. Patrick Healy, Channel 4 News, downtown Los Angeles. Condemned murder Richard Ramirez has died. Ramirez, known as the Night Stalker, put fear and terror into California residents in the 1980s. He died of liver failure while he was on death row. Patrick Healy covered the Ramirez investigation and his arrest in 1985. Patrick joins us now. He's live in East L.A., where Richard Ramirez was ultimately captured. Patrick. Chuck Colleen, all of us in L.A. in the 1980s remember the fear, the sleepless nights. When and where would the Night Stalker strike again? Well, fear did not paralyze this neighborhood. The residents spotted him. They took him down for police. Ramirez vowed vengeance. Instead, his liver gave out. Whether satanic serial killer Richard Ramirez acquired any sense of remorse during his quarter century on San Quentin's death row, now we probably never will know. Dead at 53 of liver failure, Ramirez is remembered for his own description of himself at sentencing as a servant of Lucifer. It's too bad that the uh, death penalty took so long. Frank Salerno and his partner Gil Carrillo worked tirelessly that summer of 1985 to track down the Night Stalker, who was entering homes under a cloak of darkness, assaulting and killing victims chosen at random, terrorizing the entire metropolitan area. He was convicted of 13 murders. He had no empathy, no feelings, uh, nothing. He never showed any remorse. Uh, for what he had done. He wanted to be known as the greatest serial killer that ever, you know, ever lived. After a fingerprint in a car led to the identification of Ramirez, his mug was plastered all over the news while he was on a bus returning from Arizona. Walking in East L.A., he was recognized by residents in the 3700 block of Hubbard Street. They took him down, gave him a good pummeling, and held him for police. Arriving moments later, an NBC4 news photographer, Dino Castro, who will never forget what he saw through his viewfinder. That's when he looked right at me at the camera, and that's when the hair in the back of my neck stood up because I thought I was looking at evil. It was like, oh, that's him. That's really him. He asked me, he said, Frank, he said, are you going to attend my execution? I said, yes, I am. A promise Frank Salerno fully intended to keep had the Night Stalker not died before his date with the executioner. Just a short while ago, we spoke by phone with the Night Stalker's last victim, a man who was partially paralyzed by a shot to the head, now living in North Dakota. Bill Carnes told us when he got this news this morning, I just felt like a big burden was lifted off my shoulders. Live in East L.A., where the Night Stalker's rampage ended, Patrick Healy, NBC4 News. Another serial killer, Austrian Jack Unterweger, stayed at the Cecil in 1991, possibly because he sought to copy Ramirez's crimes. While there, he strangled and killed at least three sex workers, for which he was convicted in Austria. He hanged himself shortly after his conviction. In 2013, the Cecil, by then rebranded as the Stay on Main, although still maintaining the original Hotel Cecil signs and painted advertisements on its exterior, became the focus of renewed attention when surveillance footage of a young Canadian student, Alyssa Lamb, behaving erratically in the hotel's elevator, went viral. Video depicts Lamb repeatedly pressing the elevator's buttons, walking in and out of the elevator and possibly attempting to hide from someone. It was recorded shortly before her disappearance. Her naked body was subsequently discovered in a water supply cistern on the hotel roof, following complaints from residents of odd tasting water and low pressure. How she got into the cistern remains a mystery. The Los Angeles County coroner ruled her death accidental due to drowning, with bipolar disorder being a significant factor. Details tonight in connection with a grim discovery at a downtown L.A. hotel. Police now believe the body found inside a rooftop water tank is that of a tourist who disappeared three weeks ago. Official identification has not yet been made, but police say the victim is most likely Elisa Lamb, a Canadian tourist who was last seen at the Cecil Hotel on January 31st. 
Shortly after 10 a.m., the body was found by a hotel employee following complaints of low water pressure in the building. After guests were informed, they were understandably shaken. Wouldn't you be if, if there was a dead body in the water you were using and drinking? It's kind of, it's kind of odd, the whole damn thing. Fire officials say there is no danger to hotel guests who were exposed to the water. Elisa Lamb was said to be traveling to Santa Cruz before she disappeared. Police have not said whether they suspect foul play, but the Cecil Hotel is being treated as a crime scene tonight. On February 12, 2021, Netflix released a feature-length documentary on the Cecil Hotel, which caused outcry amongst the Los Angeles community who wanted the documentary banned. What do you think people imagine when they picture the Cecil Hotel? Is there a room here that maybe somebody hasn't died in? I never got used to that. Never got used to that. Throughout its history, the Hotel Cecil has always had a dark persona. People call it Hotel Death. This was a place where serial killers let their hair down, like Richard Ramirez who would come back covered in blood, and no one's got a problem with that. A hotel with a notorious past is the site of another bizarre case. Elisa Lamb from Vancouver, Canada, is missing. The big unanswered question is, where is she? The last footage that we had of her was inside the elevator. That's where the case starts to go askew. She kept looking outside the door. Why is the elevator not going anywhere? Is someone keeping her here? Her hand movements are very strange and erratic. Like she's conjuring a spirit. It makes people wonder, is there something evil going on here? It just blew up. In the web sleuth community, it created this feeding frenzy. If it's a murder, then you need a murderer. You really don't have the full story. She was running around trying to save her own life. Bad things keep happening here over and over again. This hotel was hiding something. I would have never thought what was about to happen could happen. This is the latest chapter in a dark history for the Cecil Hotel. Well, what do you think? Do you think you could sleep where so many people have died? As always, I'm Linnea Quigley, and you're watching Paranormal Truth.